I look down on him because I am upper class. I look up to him because he is upper class. I know my place. In the 21st century, you might think climbing the social ladder has got easier. But actually, it's getting harder. In many rich countries, the class you're born into still dominates your chances of making it. No one talks about these sort of hidden privileges that are going on underneath the surface. Even in America, the so-called land of opportunity, your chances of climbing up the income ladder are some of the lowest in the rich world. What the data suggests is that we're not such a land of opportunity after all. This lack of social mobility is causing serious political rifts. When people feel they just don't have a shot, that's what leads to disaffection. It leads to radicalism in politics. So what's gone wrong? And what can be done to improve social mobility? So this is where I grew up. Feels like a lifetime ago, to be honest. As a child, Sophie Pender lived on a council estate and says hardly anyone thought she would make anything of her life. It's hard to expect anything from someone who has grown up where their dad is an alcoholic and a drug addict. I think people would just expect them to follow the path that their parents have taken. But Sophie has defied expectations she now works for a top law firm and is passionate about helping working class people to get ahead. People have felt comfortable insulting me because in their mind they think, well, if you're working class, you can change that. The onus is on you. If you live on a council estate, that's your fault. But actually, there's a whole host of factors that mean that someone might not have had, you know, the opportunities available to them. Sophie is the exception to the rule. Britain has a social mobility problem. If you're born at the bottom here, your chances of moving up the income ladder are lower than in many other rich countries. There's just a 9% probability of moving from the bottom of the income ladder to the top. It's even lower in America. But to put that in context, you're almost 50% more likely to make it to the top if you live in places like Canada or Denmark. This is known as relative social mobility. Part of the reason for these differences is the level of wealth, income inequality, and welfare provision in each country. I think America is the poster child for rising uh, income and wealth inequality. The way I like to think about it is that when you have a lot of income inequality, the rungs on the ladder of opportunity are much further apart. And that makes it harder to climb that ladder. Those at the very top of the ladder have also pulled away from everyone else. In 1975, the share of taxable income going to the top 1% in America was 9%. By 2018, that had more than doubled. And declining social mobility is bad news for American society. The fact that if you are not from that privileged background, that, that you feel like your kids are, are set up for failure to some degree. That's a very powerful political impulse and a, a real source of energy for populist movements on the left and the right, not just in America, but also across the world. It used to be much easier to get ahead. September 2nd, 1945, and America's joy bubbled over into unrestrained jubilation. After the Second World War, countries such as America and Britain enjoyed a social mobility boom. Government is big business, but far from the only one. An expansion in professional and managerial jobs allowed many working class people to move up the income ladder. And as a result, if you were born in the post-war years in America, you had a 90% chance of making more money than your parents. A picnic, it's for the children. But this didn't last. From a high in the 1940s, absolute mobility has been falling. 
and the generation of children born in the 1980s had just a 50% chance of making more money than their parents. One team of economists have dubbed this phenomenon the fading American dream. Since the Second World War in America, absolute mobility has declined. And those chances have declined uh, pretty steadily for each younger generation in America. So if you're part of the millennial generation, uh, you should be pretty uh, disturbed by all of this. There's one divide which has become especially significant, whether you've been to university or not. In rich countries, there has been an economic shift away from manufacturing towards more service-based industries, which means there are now fewer openings for those without a degree. Education has now become the new determinant of people's incomes and life chances, much more than it was 50 or 60 years ago. Now that revolution has minted winners, um, particularly in highly paid service sector jobs, doctors and lawyers. For the lower and middle class, it condemns them to a bit more of a precarious financial situation. So what can be done to bridge this social divide and widen access to higher education? In Britain, a new breed of state schools like this one have sprung up, catapulting kids from lower income families into top universities. So now let's solve this problem and then talk about what that K value means in the context. Of the NCS is located in Newham, London's second poorest borough. While nearly half the students here are on bursaries or qualify for free school meals, an indicator of deprivation, Last year, 95% went on to top universities in Britain. We're humans, we have the same capacities, we should be able to do the same things. Most will be the first in their family to get a degree, let alone one from an elite university. My parents haven't gone to university, so I didn't really have like mentors to guide me. And it, like now me aspiring to go to like Oxbridge, that's a huge deal. Coming from like a working class background, people like immigrant parents, they really like to push the education thing so much because they want their sacrifice to matter. They want children to break the class barriers that maybe, maybe acted as an actual barrier for them. Head teacher Mohsin Ismail grew up nearby and left a six figure salary as a lawyer to run the school. He is passionate about boosting social mobility. Where you're born shouldn't dictate where you end up. And just because you're not born with a silver spoon in your mouth, but if you're talented, you should be able to realize your potential. He keeps the school's performance in constant view on his office window. He says improving students' life chances means running a so-called super curriculum. As soon as you hit this wall and go outside of the box, the potential energy is infinity. And today, it's quantum mechanics. So we've got this idea that when we're inside the box... I think the difference between what we do and what other schools may lack is the forensic focus on the fundamentals, being uh, unashamedly academic, um, unapologetically ambitious for our young people. <laughs> <laughs> You've got it all worked out. It probably helps that the school only takes the very brightest. Last year, they had 4,000 applications for 300 places. How many pieces of clothing have taken? 100, yes. And schools like this are starting to make a difference by challenging private fee-paying schools, bastions of Britain's class system. You're not so clever. You can't afford the fees. So we all schools like Eton College have long been pilloried in comedy sketches like this for disproportionately feeding Britain's elite. Just over a third of the nation's prime ministers were educated there. But private schools hold over elite universities is declining. In 2016, around 40% of UK admissions to Oxford and Cambridge came from private fee-paying schools, despite the fact that only a small proportion of children attend them. But by 2020, that figure had dropped to near a 30%. We need to have the largest uh, possible attempt to drill down in society to find talent wherever it is, the hidden Einsteins, as it were. And I think this is one area where Britain is doing quite well compared with the United States. 
America is one of the only countries in the world to have legacy admissions, where colleges can actively discriminate in favor of the children of alumni. 43% of white students who graduated from Harvard between 2014 and 2019 didn't get in on academic merit alone. This helps perpetuate a cycle where if your parents are wealthy, you're more likely to graduate than if your parents are poor and did not go to college. What they've created in America is a national ruling class based on educational certificates. They're absolutely obsessed by educational credentials. If you're unfortunate enough to look at the social pages of the New York Times, it's full of saying that so-and-so with a degree from Harvard and married so-and-so. Credentialism has become the new mark of being a member of the upper classes. In America, there have been some high-profile efforts to equalize the system of university admissions. Kavika Smith has been at the forefront. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you. How's the community been? We're trying to build more people like you. Yes. There's not enough being done to help low-income students um, in America. Growing up, he dreamt of going to UCLA, but didn't get the grades he needed in his SATs, the standardized tests used in college admissions. It's a money gimmick. SATs were first introduced in 1926 as a way of increasing the pool of people admitted to Harvard. But it didn't work out like that. In recent years, Asian and white students have consistently done better on the tests than black and Hispanic students, and wealthier pupils also outperform their poorer peers. According to the most recent data, a student with a family income under $20,000 can expect to score 136 points less on their writing SAT than someone with a family income of over $200,000. It is susceptible to being prepared for. So access to test preparation, and particularly expensive test preparation, is disproportionately available to students from higher income families. And it's really not a level playing field at all. Along with a coalition of community groups, Kavika took the University of California to court over its use of SATs. And after a lengthy legal battle, the university dropped the tests from its admissions process. The University of California system will no longer consider SAT scores for admission. It could reshape the college admissions process across the entire country. But the result came too late for Kavika, who never made it to UCLA. The lawsuit was never about me. It was affirming because I knew that generations coming after me will no longer have to experience that level of discrimination. Many more colleges are now reconsidering their use of SATs and legacy admissions policies. But some argue tinkering with the admission system will do little to improve deep-rooted inequalities. A lot of the emphasis focuses on elite institutions I think that that misses the point for inequality, poverty. The composition of UC Berkeley student body, I think matters substantially less than we seem to think. It is more important to think about disparities in graduation rates from high school than it is the sort of composition of, of elite student bodies. The young people of today deserve the same opportunity to earn success and accomplishment. You have a better chance of improving social mobility if you start young. Kids from wealthier families tend to outperform lower-income children as early as primary school. But there is a simple way to boost young children's chances, and it was demonstrated in this small island nation. The story began in the late 1980s. So at that time, I would say there was a lot more poverty than there is now. Some of the homes that we went into, they were really, really very poor. Christine and Novelette were part of a pioneering scheme to help some of the poorest children get ahead. So we're here with the toys. As health workers, they would visit families every week, bringing homemade toys and games. Once I see in your uniform, mm -hmm. always looking out for you. 
you know, mm -hmm. I say, is the nurse coming? The nurse is here. These are the original toys they brought door to door. Many made from household rubbish. You would ask the child if they know any of the pictures. And most of them would know ball because, you know, Jamaicans are into football. Mm -hmm. So every little child knows a ball. This is made from old socks. The mother's reactions were mixed. There were a few wondering, what am I going to do with these things, seeing that they were made out of plastic bottles and so on. But after a few visits, they loved it. The scheme was the brainchild of physician Sally Grantham McGregor, who was working in Kingston at the time. Nobody appreciated the importance of play. There were no books, there were no toys. The children were just sitting there in the backyard, we called them the yards, doing nothing, they had nothing. So that's where I was coming from, to try and uh, improve equity a little bit. The homemade toys and books helped the kids to develop language and cognitive skills. What was unique, I think, was that we wanted to work with the mothers and we wanted to make it as cheap as possible but still effective. I feel very proud because I see that other people can come and, you know, doing the same thing that we used to go out and do, and they're benefiting from it. Sally's team, together with economists, followed the children who had taken part in the experiment. The results were extraordinary. 20 years after the experiment, the children were earning 25% more than the control group. And at the 30-year follow-up, they now earned 43% more per hour. I mean, at the time when we started, I was just desperate to make an improvement at all. But with the long-term follow-up showing such benefits, it's incredibly encouraging. The challenge now is to do it at scale, reach more children. Versions of the Jamaica program have now been set up across the world. One of the most recent is in China. Thanks to rapid industrial development, many people here have lifted themselves out of poverty, meaning the country has a high rate of what is known as absolute mobility. But your chances of moving from the lowest rungs of the income ladder to the top are still very low. It's possible to have a society with high absolute mobility, but still very low relative mobility. And you can think of emerging market economies like India and China. China in particular has taken 800 million people out of extreme poverty in the last few decades, but it's an incredibly unequal society as well. It's not just when and what you're taught as a child which can determine your life chances. It's also where you're brought up. In America, even moving a few blocks can make all the difference. This is the street I lived on. It literally looks like an alley. Dawn used to live in one of the poorer areas of Seattle. You kind of feel worthless, <laughs> you know, being here. You don't think much of yourself being here. But thanks to a groundbreaking program, she has moved to a new part of the city. It's like the kids who made fun of me in sixth grade saying that you microwave your chicken to warm it up. <laughs> it partly kind of saved me <laughs> a little bit because it has finally allowed me to feel like things are getting better, that all, everything that I've been doing all these years are leading up to a better life. Under the scheme, people who receive housing vouchers to help cover their rent are supported and helped with the costs of moving to areas of greater opportunity. It's part funded by the Gates Foundation and based on the work of a group of economists. Using decades of data from the Census Bureau, they built a so-called Opportunity Atlas for America. It's a heat map tracking how much children born in the late 70s and early 80s would go on to earn as adults. According to the Atlas data, where you grow up really matters. If you grow up in a low-income family in Harding County, South Dakota, for example, you can expect to earn much more than your parents. 
But if you're raised in Hope County, North Carolina, your household income at 35 is likely to be just $22,000, among the lowest in America. The pattern that jumps out is the incredibly high mobility rates of the Great Plains and Upper Midwest. If you ask many people, what's the highest mobility place to grow up in the country? They'll often say, you know, very highly educated cities on the coast, but the highest mobility rates by far are in places like Iowa and Nebraska. These are places where children from low-income families uh, really have just outstanding outcomes. It's not entirely clear what makes these places engines of opportunity. The researchers think it's connected to role models. Most of the areas of greatest opportunity have a high number of two-parent families, as well as good schools and low levels of segregation. According to the Atlas data, children growing up in Dawn's old area can expect to earn $12,000 a year less than those who grow up in her new neighborhood. <laughs> I literally feel like I'm one of the lottery winners. But even the scheme's advocates acknowledge moving people to better places is simply too costly and labor-intensive to be a scalable solution to improve social mobility. This is never going to be a broad-based solution because we can't just move everyone around. But on the other hand, if you even just take the incredibly narrow view that children who grow up in higher opportunity neighborhoods will themselves grow up to earn more as adults and pay more taxes as adults, you can actually get the program to pay for itself um, due to these uh, higher outcomes. Moving up the social ladder isn't just about increasing your earnings. It can also be linked to something which is harder to quantify, social capital. The invisible networks that help perpetuate the advantages those from wealthy backgrounds enjoy. Social capital is having people that you can turn to, Oh, do you know someone in this industry? Oh, can you help me with the CV? The really kind of like subtle favors that people can call upon. Sophie may be successful now, but she is keenly aware of the importance of social connections, which she lacked when she started out. I think that I had gone to uni expecting to make friends on the basis of my academic interests and my intellect. And what I realized was that actually university was this like extension of a public school system that exists in the UK. And it was really strange to me. I didn't have the networks. People would make comments about my accent. They would say, you sound really Essexy, you sound really chavvy. Sophie has founded a group dedicated to changing this. So we're gonna let the defenses down, let the side there, that's nice, yeah. This is the 93% Club, so-called after the 93% of students who attend state schools in Britain. Effectively, what we're doing is we are packaging up privilege, the kind of privilege that you can't see but is definitely operating in our society, and we give it back to students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Today, members are having headshots taken for LinkedIn profiles as well as meeting professional mentors from some of Britain's most successful firms. And, and actually, the, you know, something that you think sounds quite mundane, if you explain to someone why that was the most challenging thing you did, it will come across way better. The 93% Club now has nearly 50 branches in universities across the UK. For some of the newer recruits, the group has been a lifeline. Whether you realise it or not, your class and your upbringing ends up playing such a pivotal role in the rest of your life. It gives you these opportunities and trains you. For example, yeah. a private school parent might uh, check their CV for the child, but for example, for someone like me, I can't get my mother or father to check my CV because of the fact that they're not educated enough. It will take more than passionate individuals to improve social mobility. It requires governments to commit to improving both access to education and wealth redistribution. It's a huge task, but the post-pandemic world offers a unique opportunity for change. Social mobility and more generally income inequality has really come to the fore of the policy discussion. If there's a silver lining of the pandemic, sometimes it takes a big shock like this 
in order to really get people focused on all of these inequalities. I think we've dramatically expanded what might be possible over the past year relative to the way people thought about these problems 15 or 20 years ago. Hi, I'm Idris Kaloon, and I'm the Washington correspondent for The Economist. If you'd like to read my briefing on social mobility, then please click on the link that's opposite me. And if you'd like to watch more of our Now and Next series, then please click on the other link. Thank you very much for watching, and please don't forget to subscribe.